And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sam Savage. Dr. Sam Savage is an executive director of probabilitymanagement.org, a 501c3 nonprofit devoted to the communication and calculation of the uncertainty. The organization has received funding from Chevron, Lockheed Martin, PG&E, and others, and he is joined on the board by Harry Markowitz, Nobel Laureate in Economics. Dr. Savage is the author of The Flaw of Averages, Why We Underestimate Risk in the Face of Uncertainty, and is an adjunct professor in civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. He's the inventor of the Stochastic Information Packet, also known as SIP, an auditable data array from conveying uncertainty. Dr. Savage received his PhD in computational complexity from Yale University. My name is Pinky Medina, and I'm the program manager of the academic programs team at the Stanford Center for Professional Development, and I will be moderating today's webinar in the Q&A session. Now, I'd like to turn the floor over to Sam. Thanks, Pinky. Um, so here's, here's my first question for the audience. Um, have you had at least one statistics course in your career? Yes or no? Typically, if you have, uh, it doesn't take more than 45 minutes to repair the damage. Uh, OK, we have a lot of people who have taken statistics. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Uh, if you have, one, was it the high point of your week? Uh, you still suffer from PTSD uh, or other. Other. Okay, well, I don't know what other means, but uh, I'll proceed as if you, you know, have not uh, necessarily gotten anything out of your statistics course and uh, uh, We'll sort of start from scratch. So uh, given that we probably have a very wide range of backgrounds, I want to I want to sort of level the playing field by starting uh, with something that everybody understands. These are the differential equations of motion of a bicycle. And the point here is that you do not learn to ride a bicycle through the seat of your intellect, but through the seat of your pants. So my philosophy in teaching and in this webinar is to connect the seat of the intellect to the seat of the pants. And I call that limbic analytics. Uh, here's a sensitive rendition uh, from my book uh, from the cartoonist Jeff Danziger of someone uh, engaged in limbic analytics. Uh, Now, let's start with, let's dive right in uh, to a project that has, we're doing project risk analysis here, uh, a project that has uncertain durations. So here I have a project. Let's say we're building out a website. And we have 10 pages that need to be completed. Page one could be product one, then we have product two, then we have the shopping cart page, then we have the legal page. Uh, these, ten, these 10 pages are being created in parallel by 10 separate teams. And it's the easiest kind of project to imagine because there's no, you don't have to finish this one before you do this one, but there are these 10 teams. And of course, you're uncertain how long it will take for each team to finish. But you can't go live until all 10 teams are done. So what typically happens now is the boss walks in and says, when do we go live? And you typically say, I don't know boss, because I don't know how long team one will take, or team two, or team three. And then the boss will say something like, give me a number. And uh, I, I don't know if any of your organizations use that phrase, but uh, give me a number is the fork in the road to hell, because uh, once you've given a specific number, you really can't do any reasonable analysis. Now, let's just remember what we have here. Each of these times to completion is uncertain, but everybody agrees that on average, each one will take six weeks. Given that, given that, 
what's the chance of finishing in six weeks? So 100%, 50%? Taking a while for this poll to uh, fill in. Uh, okay, we have a winner. And uh, so the winner, oh, this is great. I hope we can save these statistics. The winner is 50%. All right. Uh, oh, that's not right, by the way, but it is the winner. It had uh, almost double what the others did. Okay, so let's move on now, uh, and let me explain uh, uh, that the actual answer is one in a thousand. And it, it's not just enough to know that it's one in a thousand, which most of you didn't, uh, but you've got to be able to explain it to a 10 year old or your boss. Uh, so look at it this way. The only way in which this project finishes in six weeks or less is if all 10 of these finished in six weeks or less. And if you imagine that each one had a 50-50 chance of being greater or less than six weeks, then that's like flipping 10 heads in a row on a coin, which is actually 1,024, but hey, I will live with one in 1,000. Got that? Now, actually, this is pretty serious stuff. The bulk of people in our little poll said, oh yeah, 50-50 chance will be done within six weeks when there's a one in a thousand chance of being done in six weeks. So uh, that's actually not close enough even for government work. This is what I call the flaw of averages. Here's another cartoon from my book. This is a statistician drowning in a river that's on average three feet deep. The flaw of averages states that plans based on average assumptions are wrong on average. And let me say, this is based on a well-known mathematical principle called Jensen's inequality. Uh, but even most mathematicians haven't heard of that. So it, it is a very important topic, and it requires some public relations uh, for people to understand it. So let me give you another more sobering example. Consider a drunk wandering back and forth on a busy highway. His average position is the center line. So the state of the drunk at his average position is alive, but on average, he's dead. Again, not close enough even for government work. Now, because this is really a public relations campaign on my part, um, and that's really the nonprofit has a lot to do with that as well, um, I've come up with an audio logo for the flaw of averages. So uh, everyone know what an audio logo is? Uh, this is the audio logo uh, for Intel. I'm sure you all recognize that. So here's the audio logo for the flaw of averages. Now, uh, let's go uh, sort of discuss how to, how to attack this problem. Uh, there is a cure for the flaw of averages, which is really why the, the nonprofit uh, is around. And it involves two recent breakthroughs. These are things that most people are not aware of. The first breakthrough is that native spreadsheets are now powerful enough to do interactive simulation. Um, a, a lot of our, 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 uh, our uh, audience here is familiar with Monte Carlo simulation. And I'll bet you're not aware that native Excel can do it without any macros or add-ins, and it can do it incredibly fast. You're gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate that in just a second. Um, the other breakthrough is that there are new standards that communicate uncertainties as auditable data. And that has led to the discipline of probability management, which I'll be describing a little bit uh, uh, further. It's a, it's a simple idea, that is, uncertainties are modeled as any other kind of data, auditable data. Now I want to point out here that uh, this is really the most important uh, message of the webinar, that due to these two breakthroughs, 
anyone anywhere with Excel can be curing the flaw of averages. Uh, so uh, uh, let me demonstrate this using dice. Because we all have a pretty good understanding of how, of how dice work. The first comment is that we're going to represent the uncertainty of these dice as arrays of die rolls. So if I look down here, right, my first roll is a four, a six, and a five. The second one is a three, a two, and a six. And uh, this goes down 10,000 times, which is 10,000 die rolls. Uh, I can look at any roll. Oh, by the way, I remember that roll 9,765 is three ones. You wouldn't want to bet against me because it's just auditable data. I haven't memorized all 10,000 of them, but that was distinctive, so I remembered that. But now is, is the amazing thing. In native Excel, using something called the data table, data, what if analysis, data table, and I'm sure that at least two or three percent of the audience is familiar with the data table. Most people aren't. But the data table lets me roll these dice incredibly fast. So uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to roll the first die 10,000 times, and we're going to see the percentages of ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, and six. Okay, get out your stopwatch. On your mark, get set, go. Did you time that? No, of course not. It was instantaneous. Instant simulation in native Excel. Here, let's add the results of two dice together. So when I do this, I get the numbers between 2 and 12. Uh, 2 is the smallest, 12 is the biggest. Do I get all the numbers in between with equal probability? If anyone thinks so, I hope they brought their wallet. The answer is no. It's not even anymore. There are w many ways to get a 7, a 1 and a 6, a 6 and a 1, a 5 and a 2, a three, all those. There's only one way to get a 2, two ones or a 12, two sixes. This was native Excel. It's an XLSX file. I could immediately send this to a billion of my closest friends. And look, I can undo it as well. Control Z, minus 10,000, Control Z, another 10,000, Control Y, plus 10,000. So if you're into Monte Carlo simulation, you should be excited to, to learn that native Excel can do interactive Monte Carlo. Interactive Monte Carlo means that you can do limbic analytics and ride this thing like a bicycle. So this is really a miracle. This is this has done for simulation what cold fusion uh, would have done for energy if it had actually worked. All right, now let's go back to this problem. I'm going to show you how we would use this in, in a practical setting. First thing to tell you is, yes, we have a SIP library now. So in the, in the age of big data, a lot of people have data on uh, how long it takes to do this task and that task. And so it's relatively easy to set up uh, a SIP library like this. Uh, so that means that when I'm scrolling along here, look at this, that could happen or that could happen or that could happen. I'm scrolling through like a thousand parallel universes. And notice we're now doing limbic analytics. You could show this to your boss, right? Hey boss, this could happen or this could happen. And notice we don't go live until the last of these are done and it's uncertain and holy Toledo, I don't see how it'll ever be done in six weeks. So I've done this all the time with managers and this really catches their attention. Remember, limbic analytics ties into the reptilian brain, you know? You see the movement, and it's like that scene out of Jurassic Park where the guy's waving the flashlight back and forth. The Tyrannosaurus sees movement, and so does uh, your manager. All right, uh, but let's make this, let's thicken the plot a little bit here. Suppose there were a contract with performance penalties, so, okay, Someone told them we'd be done in seven weeks. And you agreed to a late penalty of 100000 per week or a fraction thereof if you're late. Uh-oh, how is that going to look? 
Well, if you plug in all the average assumptions, you're done in six weeks with no penalty. Great. But I'm not as interested in that as I am the following. I want to know the average of all thousand of these things. See, scenario three, scenario four. We're going to do this a thousand times, and I want the average of those numbers over all thousand scenarios. That's what the flaw of average is about. It says that the number you get when you plug in the average is not the same as the average over all scenarios. So remember, plug in the averages, you, you're done in six weeks with no penalty, but on average, you're done in 7.8 weeks with almost $87,000 in penalty. Not close enough, even for folk music. Now, let's see how we would manage in a situation like this. First of all, hopefully the, this, the contract has not been signed yet, so you go running back and you go to the counterparty, you say, oh, please, 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 pretty please, would you give us a $50,000 penalty? And they say, happy to do it as long as you finish in six weeks. Oh, no. Now we have a $92,000 penalty on average. Quick hit Control-Z a couple times. We don't want to do that. Well, guys, would you let us finish in eight weeks? And they say, sure. But now we're jacking our penalty up to $150,000. Hey, we're taking that deal. Look, now our penalty's down to 23,000. Just in native Excel. So I hope you see that there's a there there. Uh, we can really be doing this stuff and we can be doing it, uh, we can be doing it now. So uh, there is a uh, a template in, in native Excel that does a much bigger job of this. Uh, in fact, uh, if you go to in Excel 2016, there are templates for doing all sorts of special things. They have several of them that do Gantt charts. So this, what you're looking at here is, is very much like the little tiny example, but in this one, some tasks have to precede other tasks. And it's all done deterministically, just basically these are the numbers and flaw of averages and all that. Uh, I built this into a SIPMath model. Um, now, we refer to the data containing the uncertainties as a SIP. So the die rolls, the, that, those 10,000 trials for each die, that was called a SIP. Why did I use SIP? Well, you're all, you already have a little spot in your mind for bit and byte. So I knew I needed SIP and slurp so it would like fit into the same little slot. Um, SIP stands for Stochastic Information Packet. Um, and, and we will, uh, and we refer to SIP math as running these SIPs through Excel or any other program as well. If I click the SIP math button, suddenly this is looking at a thousand trials. See, sit math off, sit math on uh, in this model. And now, if I scroll through the trials, look out over here. You see, that's where the project ends, way down there on the right. And as I scroll through, that can happen, or that can happen, or that can happen, or that can happen. And again, this is just native Excel. Uh, another very common sort of risk in projects is Will the project pay for itself? Will you make money? And how big an investment should you make? Because you don't know what the market size is, right? So demand is always uncertain when you're doing a new, a new product. So let's do another example, very classic one. Uh, you know, you could argue that these models are just so small, they're unrealistic. I say, Okay, then I presume you can small, solve the small ones in your head. Uh, apparently not. Uh, most people thought that little project was going to be done, had a 50-50 chance of being done in, uh, in six weeks, and it's only one in a thousand. So here's another one that's a little counterintuitive. We've got a new project, product or service, I guess. It's, it's just a product. And the actual demand is uncertain but the average is 100,000. 
So the capacity, the cost of capacity is $30 a unit. And the selling price per unit is $40 a unit. Now, since the average demand is 100,000, we're going to plan for a capacity of 100,000. Good. Now the boss walks in and says, what's profit going to be? And you say, I don't know, boss, because I don't know what demand is going to be. And the boss says, give me a number, because he's the boss. And you say, would you settle for an average profit? Well, if that's all you can give me. So you say, look, we all agree there's an average demand of 100,000. Yes, the boss says, we all agree. So we're going to stock, we're going to have a capacity of 100,000. Yeah, that all makes sense. OK, we'll expect sales of 100,000. Uh, we're going to make four million from your 40 bucks a piece. We're going to, the cost of, of goods sold, the fact that we had to tool up and, you know, build these things is uh, three million. And therefore, the profit is one million. Okay. Well, let's just address this for a second. What if the demand was 80,000? Remember, we're not certain about the demand. And the first thing I would do would be put in a value a little below 80, 000, a little below 100,000, a little above 100,000, just the first step. Let's just do these experiments. Take it down to 80,000, and you didn't make your million dollars, did you? You only made 200,000. Sure. But we know that 100,000 was just the average, so it could be greater. It could be. It could be like 120,000. Yeah. See? Well, wait a minute. You're hosed. You, you've got a demand of 120,000, but you only have a capacity of 100,000. There's this nasty little if statement in here that says that if the actual demand is greater than the capacity, you are stuck with the capacity. Otherwise, you fill the actual demand. So if we look down at the bottom, the bottom line is the profit is still a million. A million isn't your average profit. A million is the best, best possible case. All right. So what do we do about this? Well, I'd like to run a simulation. Here is a problem with simulations. I love them. I love them to death. But the general public can't use simulation generally because they don't know how to generate the required distributions of random numbers. This takes a statistician or something. This is a serious, serious uh, uh, block for using uh, simulation. But you know, one day I realized we all use light bulbs, and yet we don't know how to generate the electricity for our light bulbs. How do we do that? Well, I figured it out. We have something called the power grid, and we run electricity through, through the power grid. It's generated by experts, and the rest of us use it. But what it required was a standard. We call it the 60 cycle AC voltage standard, and the new data standards that I've mentioned that that are maintained by probabilitymanagement.org are the equivalent of this 60 cycle, 120 volt AC current standard. So now let's talk about forecasting. Because forecasting is actually where we get the distribution of uncertainties. And it generally works like this. By the way, you can get distributions of uncertainties to feed your simulation. You can get that from almost any simulation, or f excuse me, from any forecast. You can get the distribution from almost any forecast. Uh, this one has a 95% upper and lower confidence interval. That leads to a bell-shaped distribution. And typically, so people will do this analysis and they'll create the distribution. And that's right, folks. They flush it down the toilet. That's what they do with it. They end up with a single number. And of course, you know what happens next. 
So let me show you how we deal with this. Uh, in probability management. You're looking at a SIP library. It was created using a forecast. I'm not even going to go into the details of it. Do you want to hear how the electricity was generated that's lighting the light bulbs in your office? No, you don't care. You just want to use the light bulb. So think of this as the electricity. It's going to contain a thousand possible demands for this new product. It has metadata. So for example, the metadata tells, oh yeah, the average demand is 100,000. And it tells us where the metadata is stored. Oh, look at those. Those are my initials. There's provenance. In other words, it, this is not just a distribution that the cat dragged in. Um, and if I click the plus sign, boom, there are all 1,000 trials. All right, so it's just a library. Now I'm going to go back to, to this model. And I'm going to open the SIPMath tools. Now these are, there's a free version of these out on the website. And um, everything I'm doing here, I could do by, by hand in Excel, but the tools make it uh, a lot easier and they're free. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is initialize my model. Um, and I'm going to say, select a library to plug into. I'm going to go to an external workbook. And webinar and uh, oh, there it is demand. So here's the library for demand for my product. Now I put the cursor in this cell, go to library input, ask for demand. Ooh, and there's a little distribution there. Look at that. Is that cute? That's called a sparkline graph in Excel. And we're now dialed in to all those thousand possible demands. Uh, so I can go to de demand two. It was only 75,000, by the way. Look at that. I only made $23,000 that time. Uh, Demand three, I made my million. It's auditable. I remember number nine isn't very nice. Oh, nine. Uh, okay, why isn't it? Let me type typing nine. Well, let's get down. To, let's get up to nine here. Nine is worth looking at. Because on trial nine, we only had sixty-six thousand in demand, and we lost three hundred twenty-five million dollars. So remember. You told the boss, this is basically, hey, I expect a million bucks. And the boss is going to say, well, you didn't tell me about the chance of losing $325 million. Let's go back and look at the average here. There's our average. And uh, what we see is that we make a million bucks. Right. Now, what's happened here is that when I initialize the model, it created another sheet in back where the data table is going to put the simulation. And what I'm going to do now is put my cursor in the profit cell, define that as an output, click over here, and a thousand trials later, ooh, there's another nice little graph there. And what this is showing me is that profit isn't bell-shaped at all. Profit is limited on the upside by a million dollars. Now here's the cool part. There is now a range on this sheet named profit. That's a column of a thousand parallel universes of profit. And that means I can go up here and I can type equals average of profit. So the profit of the average is a million. The average profit has got to be less, right? Because it can either go down from a million or be at a million, but the average is something less than a million and a million has got to be less, but how much less? Oh my God, 600,000? So the, the profit of the average is a million. The average profit is 600,000.
how do you run a business this way? Now, at this point, um, I'm going to discuss what I call the levels of stochastic enlightenment. So let me be, be clear here. Part of limbic analytics is to explain everything to, like to a 10-year-old. So in the Flaw of Averages book, I've got this concept of red words and green words. Uh, a red word is some technical thing you heard in a statistics course, and it would just give you PTSD to hear it again. Uh, and in the back, there's a back of the book, there's a red word, green word glossary. And uh, maybe we can zoom in on that. Ooh, I don't know if we can see that or not. Red word. But the, the important thing to notice is the red words are written in Dracula font. That was that was uh, the publisher's idea. I love it. Um, so the, the, the best way to define a red word is something that could not be uttered in a singles bar. Uh, now, here I have a red word, stochastic, and I'm using it to pay, poke fun at it. But I'm talking about the levels of stochastic enlightenment, which means how do you deal with uncertainty? So let's start with level zero, dumb. The boss comes in and says, what's profit going to be? And you say, I don't know, boss, because I don't know what profit's going to be. A good step below dumb, level minus one. Dumber. Use the average demand and say, oh, boss, we're going to make a million bucks. Let me point out that this is also accepted pra practice. Worse than that, it's actually gap, generally accepted, accepted accounting principles. So that's horrible. Uh, step one, smart. Level one, smart. Simulate. Right. Um, simulating, you know, how many people have, have heard about garbage in, garbage out? Oh, yeah. It's garbage in, garbage out. You put in a bad distribution, you get a bad simulation. Wrong. When you shake a ladder before you climb on it to paint the side of your house, you are performing a Monte Carlo simulation on the ladder, bombarding it with random forces and monitoring the response of the ladder. I got bad news for you. The distribution of forces when you shake a ladder is very different than when you climb on it. So I want to know out of all our attendees, we should have a survey for this, but we don't. How many of you are going to stop shaking ladders now that I've told you you've been using the wrong distribution for your whole life? No. Simulate. It's smart. Garbage in insight out. But let's go to the next step. Smarter. Optimize. Let's go back to our uh, problem over here. So if you had done the right analysis, you would know now that this million dollar project is worth 600,000 on average. Ain't great. Can you do something to make the situation better? So let me remind you that any demand over 100%, over 100,000, excuse me, which is the average, right? Any demand over 100,000 is not going to be met because you only stock the average down here. So it seems to me we should, we should increase capacity to above 100,000. Well, that might be risky. Because you have to spend more money to do that, right? It's 30, 30 bucks a pop for that additional, gee, maybe we should make the capacity smaller. Maybe we should leave it as it is. Oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. What do you think we should do? Let's take a poll. So, our average profit is now 600,000. To increase that average profit, should we increase our capacity and spend more money to make a bigger capacity? Uh, should we decrease our capacity, we'll, won't spend as much money, or should we maintain current capacity? What do people think about this? Looks like a lot of head scratching going on out there. Okay, the increased capacity uh, wins, 
got 47 percent, decreased capacity is about 30 percent, and stay the same as 23 percent. Okay, very good. So let's go back. Uh, the, 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 the winners wanted to increase capacity, so let's do that. Let's just jack this up to, say, 120,000. Remember what we're trying to beat down here is 600,000. Here goes, 120,000. Eh. Our profit dropped, our average profit dropped by more than half down to 279. Now let's reduce capacity to 80,000. And it goes up from 600,000 to 600, almost 80,000. Fantastic. Now, let me make a confession. This is a problem out of one of my textbooks. And I designed this problem so that it would be more profitable to increase capacity. So I designed the problem, and then I simulated it. And it said, no, it's less profitable to increase capacity. And then I say, oh, I must be wrong. No. I said, oh, I must have built my model wrong. And I went through that phase of denial for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes till I found out, no, I was wrong. The answer to this question is, and the next time you see a question like this, should we make more, should we make less, should we, the answer is, you can't do this in your head, so don't try. All right, uh, now, let's go to the next phase with this thing and do a bunch, a bunch of simulations for different capacities. So what we've done in this case is we've run seven simulations where we have a 50,000, 60,000, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110,000 capacity. And it's important to understand what we're graphing. The blue line is the average profit for those different levels of capacity. The red line is the 10 percent, the 10th percentile, which means there's a 10 percent risk that we will fall below that line, right? So just for example, I like to think of this line as risk. So, okay, 80 is the best. You can see it in the graph. You make 679,000 on average, yeah. But um, there's a 10% chance of making $20,000 or less. Now, one of the things I have to say here about risk, I don't like to use the word at risk. It takes a lot of caveats before you use that, that word. You've got to really know what you're talking about. Here's a question for you. Is there a risk that IBM stock will go down next week? Heck no. I've shorted the stuff. The risk for me is that it goes up. Risk is in the eye of the beholder. You must always remember that uncertainty. Well, uncertainty is just like, you know, stuff happens, right? So is IBM stock price uncertain? Yes. Is there a risk that it goes up? For me, yes. Is there a risk that it goes down? For you who own IBM stock? Yes. So let's, I'm a little hesitant to, to really nail down the word risk, but let's look at this. We started here at 100,000. We were stock, we were, we had a capacity of 100,000. Well, that only gave us 60, uh, uh, 600,000 in average profit. Oh yeah, and a 10% chance of losing almost 600,000. So, stocking 100,000 or having a capacity of 100,000 is nuts. Um, in fact, why would anyone do anything greater than 80? 80 maximizes your profit and gives you less risk than these other ones. So I got to draw a straight line here. Any strategy to the right of that line is nuts. Now let's back up. What if I back down to 70,000? Well, I lose a little average profit, don't I? Came down a little bit. A little over 600,000. What about my, what about the risk of bad outcomes? Well now, look, my worst, 10th percentile outcome and my average are closed up on each other. There's almost no uncertainty there. 
So there's way less risk. So if we have a capacity of 70,000, we have minimum risk. So is 70,000 is 70, nuts? No, this depends on your risk attitude. If you want to go for broke and have the highest average profit, you go to 80. If you want to cover your butt and minimize the chance of downside, you go to 70. But how about less than 70? It's nuts because the red line is coming back down and the blue line is coming back down. So when you're doing simulation analysis, there may not be one right answer. It's going to depend on your risk attitude. There's a range of answers that are not nuts. Everything else is just crazy here, though. All right. Now let's move on to operational risk. And uh, we've been doing some exciting work uh, with PG&E here in Northern California. There's an article in the December 2016 uh, ORMS Today. And I believe there, there's links to this at, our, at the Probability Management website. I think we have links other places around. We'll, we'll get you those links. It, it, it really gives you a, a nice uh, flavor for how probability management works. Uh, and I want to give you a, a, an example now. When we say rolling up risk, one of the great, great benefits of using SIPs is that we can roll up the results of independent simulations. Just think of the two SIPs of the dice, right? I could add the first two elements together and the second two and the third down to the 10,000th element. I would now have a SIP of the sum of the dice. And adding up uncertainties is, is just not that easy to do. So here's an example now. This is not a real live model. I mean, it is, it's real and live, but it is a, not of a real situation. It, it's sort of like a, a balsa airplane of a model. Uh, we've got 10,000 trials here. Uh, we have a bunch of, of gas pipeline assets, uh, pipes, valves, fittings. For each asset, I have three SIPs representing financial risk, safety risk, reliability risk. They're stored in the SIP library. You saw what that looks like. Now in Excel, it's just pure Excel, I'll bet a bunch of you have seen these little filter things, right? Where you can actually say, oh, just show me some of the, some of the rows. Uh, by the way, we've rolled up the total financial risk up here, uh, the total safety risk, the total reliability risk. But let me go to the asset tab and let me say, hey, let's just look at the pipes. Click, and that was 10,000 trials now of the conditional risk given that we're just looking at the pipes. Now, how do you know if you have a risk model? You should be able to tell me the chance of something bad happening. So for example, for example, what's the chance that the financial risk is over 40 million? Uh, it's 100% apparently, okay. What if I change that to 60 million? Oh, there's only a 30% chance that the risk is greater than, that, that, that the uh, financial loss will be greater than uh, 60 million. What about 55 million? 78%. So if you can't do that, you don't have a risk model. You gotta be able to tell me the chances of something happening. Now another uh, thing discussed in that article, and what I'm showing you now I don't think anyone in the world has fully implemented yet. I call it a consolidated risk statement because we're still in pretty early innings with probability management. We're making a lot of, uh, a, a lot of strides and, uh, and, and the technology is changing fast. But here's the idea behind a consolidated risk statement. That I've again got three kinds of risks, financial, safety, reliability. Uh, Oh, but I've got, I'm going to roll it up across a couple divisions. This really has not been possible in the past to easily add up the results of different simulations running on different platforms. Excel, MATLAB, uh, 
are you can do sit math with 10,000 people with abacuses. The first person would do the first number, the second person would do, I mean, it, it's just a very general open concept. Um, oh, these divisions. Yeah, well, the divisions have business units. Right. And then what goes into these risks here? Well, of course, probability distributions go in. And so there's uh, the financial risk, the safety risk, the reliability risk, and let's drill down a little further. So in risk management, there's an important concept uh, known as the risk exceedance curve, and it's really just the flip side of a, uh, of a probability cumulative curve. So let me zoom in on this. Here we have financial risk. I'm looking at the blue curve. And let me run out here to the blue curve. And it tells me that there is a 30% chance of losing $36.4 million or more. Right, and that's right here at the 30% level. Um, now, there's a red curve on here as well. Remember, we said risk is in the eye of the beholder. There's a red curve on here that represents your risk tolerance. And this means, if we go down to this end of the curve, that you can tolerate more risk than you actually have. That's good. But when I get down here and your risk tolerance is below the blue curve, then that just says you can't live with that, right? Let, let, let's see what this red curve says right here. Click on that. It says there's a 10% chance um, of, a, of, 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 we can tolerate a 10% chance of losing $38.3 million. Yeah, but if I go up here, we see that there's actually like a 20% chance of that, all right? Now, now, here we have some limbic analytics going on. I am going to invoke insurance now against that financial risk and watch the curves change. Oh, the, the insurance brought the blue curve down below my red curve, so I'm feeling comfortable. All right? Now, let's just do a quick time check. Um, I have one more example I can do, or we can stop for questions here. Uh, do one more example. Okay. So... Uh, this next one uh, is an example involving the risk of a project R&D portfolio. And so <clears throat> uh, this is, um, it's based on a real world example, but all the numbers have been changed and anonymized and we don't have to talk about the actual company, but um, I, I was approached by folks at one point who said, uh, the, the way we model, and, and think, of a, think of a big R&D pharmaceutical with about 100 uh, pharmaceutical products, 100 drugs in the pipeline, very, very risky. And first of all, they had trouble, mod they could model the finances of any individual drug. What they couldn't do was roll them up into a portfolio to understand the portfolio risk. And furthermore, um, there were a lot of portfolio effects. Uh, this is the kind of thing that SIPs can do very well. You can use SIPs to roll up risk. Well, one of the issues was this, that if you look at the return, lifetime revenue of a drug, that it's very uncertain. The bulk of them make almost nothing and there are a few whoppers out here, Viagra and Lipitor, just made tons and tons of money. The average drug makes about a billion. And so what they were saying is, we've been using this one billion to represent the revenue of a drug, but gee, maybe we should be simulating that because there really is a distribution. And I thought, yeah, maybe you should. Uh, so let's take a look at what happened. They were simulating a whole bunch of of different pharmaceuticals, uh, different drugs, and 
um, they were doing them under a bunch of different uh, conditions that affected all the drugs at once, like the what's the discount rate, what's the probability of success of different classes of drugs. And uh, so in particular, one of the things we, we were able to look at is, well, what would happen if you use the one billion average versus you use the full distribution, okay? Let's see if, if, if the difference is big enough to view with the naked eye. Uh, by the way, imagine, now this is all make-believe numbers, but suppose our NPV target, net present value target is five a billion. Well, right now it's showing we have a 97% chance of achieving that target, but, th but that's because we're using the single average over here, okay? Now I'm going to use the full distribution. And by the way, this is going to be 5,000 trials when I click this, over 100 uh, uh, drugs, many, many experiments. This is like 300 million numbers running through this model. Okay, I'm going to click the full distribution and see if you can tell the difference, okay? Full distribution of drug prices, 1 billion average instead of the full distribution. So the average, full, okay, can you tell the difference? Okay, now shut your eye, your left eye, okay. Is that better or is that better? Oh, and by the way, check over here. The chance of achieving your 5 billion target went from 97% to 44%. Okay, 97% to 44%. Uh, those aren't close enough even for folk music. All right, so with that, I think I'd like to hear uh, from the audience, uh, see what questions you have. Thank you very much, Sam, for this informative pre presentation, and I hope all of us can walk away feeling more knowledgeable about your work in this field. And now we will move on to answering your questions. So the first question is, your presentation was incredibly engaging. Can you talk about what the course will be like? How will it be structured and what kinds of assign assignments will there be? So um, uh, none of my successes have been planned and none of my plans have been successful. I, that's why I do stochastic modeling, right? Life is uncertain. The class will depend on, on the students who take it. but it will be project-based. So one of the first things we're going to learn is what I call the arithmetic of uncertainty. And it will all be done in Excel. And virtually every week you'll have new Excel uh, projects to do. But what I really want to do is have students go out and search for real world projects. Um, I am in negotiations now with some, with some companies that have project data and I'd like to, um, to have the students try to create SIP libraries so that, for example, suppose I'm pouring concrete somewhere and, you know, I know that the temperature is going to be between uh, 60 and 80 degrees and I have to pour 150 yards of concrete. I'd like to be able to have a distribution of how long that concrete will take to set up. And, I'll, and I'd like to find uh, build libraries like this, and then be able to assemble them into bigger projects. Oh, a little bit like that Gantt chart you saw that's in, in Excel. It would be fun to populate that with real distributions. Okay. And the second question is, your presentation did an excellent job of clearly communicating statistics. How would the clear communication of statistical ideas be incorporated into the class? Um, well, as I mentioned, um, I like to have uh, explanations that a 10-year-old will understand. Uh, my motto is, uh, this stuff is easy to explain. The hard part is getting anyone to understand it. And at the end of the class, there are going to be class presentations. So we're not going to have a final. We're going to have a class project, right? And the, the class project requires you to get up there and not explain it. You don't get any points for explaining it. You get points for getting people to understand what you're doing. And so I will encourage class participation and uh, uh, learning how to, how to explain things clearly uh, ends up being probably way more important than even getting the analysis right. Uh, or you can't get, I don't even think you can get the analysis right if you can't explain it clearly. They're, they're just too intimately tied up and, and people don't, um, spend nearly as much time on the communication aspect. So for me, you know, I think of myself as basically a public relations guy. 
Uh, this Jensen's inequality has been around for over 100 years and no one knows about it. So uh, Jensen's inequality is my anchor tenant. And of course, the flaw of averages is the word I gave it to try to get people to understand it. And we only have uh, time for one more question. This kind of analysis depends on the data you use for a simulation. In your course, will you be covering best practices for collecting data? I will certainly cover approaches uh, for, for gathering data. There, there are a number of them. The, the first thing is that people get too hung up on that. So remember shaking the ladder? Uh, close counts with horseshoes, hand grenades, and simulation. And by the way, there are some recent advances that really that help us uh, turn data into SIP libraries. It's very exciting. I'm working with some colleagues on that um, now. And uh, we'll certainly spend plenty of time on that. Uh, but we also have to get you basically over the hump of doing it with very little data. Don't get blocked by that. Oh, I'll just say one last thing about this. Some people say, oh, no, no, I couldn't, I couldn't simulate anything because I don't have enough data, right? If you don't have enough data, that means you are very, very uncertain about what's going on. So saying, I couldn't do analysis because I don't have enough data is like saying, I couldn't learn how to use a parachute because the wing of the airplane is on fire. Thank you very much, Sam, for answering these questions. We're at the top of the hour, so unfortunately, we will not have time for additional questions. If you'd like to learn more about the course, please don't hesitate to reach out to us directly. Our contact information is available on our website, scpd.stanford.edu. Also, make sure to check your inbox for the webinar recording within the next two weeks. Thank you again for joining us today, and we wish you all the best as you pursue your education goals. Thanks for attending.